Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 197. And this episode is with a living legend in the philosophical world and the animal ethics world, Martha Nussbaum, who is the Ernst Freund Distinguished Service Professor of Law and Ethics at the University of Chicago, where she has appointments in both the Department of Philosophy and the law school. So Martha has made numerous major contributions to ancient philosophy, to ethics, political philosophy, the philosophy of law, and other areas in both the academic and public intellectual spheres. Martha's most recent book is Justice for Animals, Our Collective Responsibility. And in this episode, that is what we discuss. So it's particularly fitting that we have Pins the Podcat here and then Mishka the Vishla, who is currently resting right behind me. But more particularly, we get into philosophical conceptions of justice, various approaches to animal ethics, such as utilitarianism and briefly Kantianism, the capabilities approach to freedom and justice that Martha developed with her friend, the Nobel laureate economist Amartya Sen, and how people ought to think about eating meat. So there is a link to Martha's wonderful book, Justice for Animals, in the description. Other than that, reviews, likes, comments, subscribes, these things are so extraordinarily appreciated by me. And there is also a Patreon if you would like ad-free episodes, a link to an ad-free RSS feed, and then show notes. And now, without any further ado, I hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Mark. Before we get into some of the broader animal ethical context and your arguments in Justice for Animals, I wanted to start with how the project began for you, because I know that it involved some very close work with your daughter. Yeah, well, I had been interested in broad <clears throat> broadening the capabilities approach <clears throat> to include animals for quite some time. And as you may know, in, in the book Frontiers of Justice in 2006, I started to do that. But then at that very time, my daughter was in law school. She had been a historian, and then she stopped uh, teaching history, went to law school at the University of Washington, and got fascinated with, particularly with marine mammals. But anyway, then she got a job at an NGO in Denver that worked with animal rights. And she got deeply steeped in working for the rights of wild animals in particular. And so she wrote a lot about marine mammals, but what she worked on, and of course there aren't any marine mammals in, in Colorado. So she worked on things like the American bison and great conch and, and so forth. So I followed this work very closely. And eventually we started to write papers together. And we wrote, uh, well, ultimately we wrote five articles together. But what what would happen is she would supply the legal issues about marine mammals that she was thinking about, and I would fold in philosophical reflections. And we presented these at the Human Development and Capability Association several years running. And we formed a little group of people who started to work together on the rights of well, all kinds of animals. And so, so it, it's really that the rest of that group is still working, and we're going to have a big conference. In fact, that came out of my Balzan Prize in in nineteen um, in in twenty twenty two. Half of the money had to go to setting up a project to work on something you care about. So I did a project on the rights of, of animals and included lots of former students as the supervisory committee. So anyhow, um, Rachel, of course, died in 2019. It was very, very tragic. And I, you know, felt totally devastated. But I also thought the only the way I found to go on was to redouble my dedication to the things that she stood for and the things that she loved and couldn't bring her back. But I might be able to keep these issues going and to, you know, to believe that her spirit was there someplace animating this work and i still i still feel that it is mm -hmm. that's 
tragic and, and wonderful uh, as well at the same time. But just a couple of things that you, you've mentioned already that jumped out at me is you said that you were very concerned with broadening the capabilities approach. And then you've also already mentioned wild animals. But one of the really terrific things about your book is how the capabilities approach, which we'll get into shortly, it doesn't just deal with pets or wild animals. It deals with all of them and farm animals and all these things. So it's really an all encompassing. Well, you know, I think that it's really, when you think about where we are in terms of current law, we have lots of laws protecting the animals that people live with. I hate the word pets, by the way. It suggests that that's a toy. And I don't think you think that pins and the Vichel are toys. (laughs) Um, So let's say companion animals, okay? But companion animals are well protected by law. And there are all kinds of laws dealing with that. But, of course, the animals we eat are the least protected. So all kinds of laws that we have, like the Animal Welfare Act, explicitly leave out chickens, cattle, all the animals that we eat. Even the Migratory Bird Treaty Act protects all birds against harassment, except for the birds that we eat. So it's a Mm. terrible situation, and it's actually the creature's in the wild or the least protected. Then, of course, with some of them, the problem is that they're not in any one place and they roam across national boundaries. And we can get to that problem later. But anyway, I, you know, I, I think all, all sentient beings are equal and they all have a right to get to where they're trying to go, at least, you know, until some kind of death that we're not to blame for impedes them. So mm-hmm. I really do feel the capabilities approach should include all that. Now, that is very controversial, even now, within the Human Development and Capability Association. My collaborator, Amartya Sen, has not agreed to do that, although I think he understands the concerns, but he, he shows sympathy, but he hasn't yet made that a full part of his approach. And there are people in the association who believe that if we focus on animals, we're taking something away from poor people. Now, I don't think that's true, but I think we have to talk about that and I'm sure you and I will talk about that in due course. But anyway, that's where I'm going. And and so, as I said, within the association, we form this wonderful group. It's Well, there are four people besides me who form this little group, and then Rachel was fifth. And um, then we're still working together. And I think, you know, a lot of other people, of course, have chimed in, but that's the core. And then what we're doing with the Balzan Project, we had a competition, which in the first instance, I invited former students to submit. And we got a wonderful small group of younger scholars. So we have kind of threefold thing. There's me, and then there's the mid-career scholars that I've worked with for a long time, and then the group of 12 younger scholars. And we're all going to produce a book together. So that's what I'm doing immediately. But yes, I think it needs to happen all over the place. Hmm. Well, a couple more concepts you've mentioned that are really interesting that we'll get to are the notions of sentience and wildness. Uh, But for now, the theory of justice that your book centers on, it revolves around the concept of a flourishing life and its corollary, a, a thwarted flourishing life. And this is something that also links human theory of justice and animal theory of justice. But maybe we should go through just to get these nailed down, a couple of examples of flourishing and and thwarted animals. Well, I think it's kind of hard to pin down the intuitive idea of injustice, but I think when we start reflecting on it, we usually think in terms of a a creature who's trying to go someplace, who's trying to do something that's part of their life, and then they get blocked by some kind of, not, not just by nature, so to speak, but by something for which others are to blame, usually humans in this case. So that's my core idea of injustice, that animals are pursuing a set of goals and what their capabilities are, are the spaces for choice within which, whether it's humans or other animals, they can choose to pursue those goals. But of course, usually often they're blocked by one thing or another, by conduct that's either wrongful or negligent, and that's what injustice is. That, so that's, that's my core idea. And so then what justice would be on the other side is protecting those spaces within which 
all sentient beings would have the chance to pursue the goals that are part of their life. And of course, that's what the capabilities approach had done all along for human beings. So what we, what we had said to the development economics world is don't just measure prosperity and how well things are going by measuring gross national product per capita. That's just an average. It doesn't really tell you how people are actually doing because it's it's an average. So therefore, it doesn't tell you who's at the bottom, who's at the top, who's blocked, who's flourishing. And it also aggregates together the different parts of a life. Now, someone might be doing well in the area of work, but not so well in the area of health, entitlement to health insurance, for example. And I think, you know, when you think about what's wrong with the U.S., there's this great unevenness in people's capabilities. They don't have very good capabilities in the area of health or indeed of bodily integrity. We need to go into that. But anyhow, what, what Amartya Sen and I tried to say is what you should try to measure, and of course it's not easy to measure the things that are most worth measuring, is what people are actually able to do and to be. And it's those spaces for choice and self-actualization that are the person's capabilities. So we had been doing that for a long time for humans. And then for animals, it's it's the same thing, except that, of course, we don't know that much about animals. So we first have to say, what goals is this type of animal pursuing? And what stands in the way of this animal pursuing its goals? And that means that the list of core capabilities can't just be the old human list. It had it could be similar because after all, we're all in this world together and we going after a lot of the same sorts of things. But each animal has its own way of pursuing those goals, its own forms of perception, imagination, thought, self expression. So we have to get to know a lot more. But fortunately science has been doing a fantastic job of late. And I am one of the things that I had a ball doing writing this book is just learning from science. I read so much and I felt like, I mean, I wasn't doing the science, but I felt I really understood the kind of work that scientists were doing to establish whether animals of a certain type felt pain and so on and so on. So anyway, that's the work that we need to do and say, what does an elephant need to have a flourishing life? Well, once we do that work, I think we see that even a very humane zoo can't give an elephant a good life because what elephants need for a flourishing life is lots of space to move around in. I mean, an elephant in the wild will cover 200 miles a day. And it also needs a rich society. Elephants, like many kinds of animals, are highly social. They form a matriarchal group that's usually pretty large, but minimum for adult females. And then, of course, the young are brought up communally in that group. And the males kind of, after they're adult, they go off, but then they go back, they come and go. So that's the social structure that elephants need. And each animal has its own form of, of social life. So that's the kind of thing we, we need to build into the approach if we're to see what's a, what's a just life for that kind of animal. Mm -hmm. I think um, a word that fits in really well here with the justice injustice dichotomy is autonomy. And a flourishing animal is able to exhibit its autonomy. And I, I often joke with well, Pins doesn't understand anything I say, but when she meows at me angrily, it, it typically is when I am thwarting her autonomy. So if I pick her up when she wants to be scratching the cat, the, the couch or, or something like that. Um, but I often wonder whether I'm being a bad companion animal to her when, I mean, she is, I don't know, chittering her teeth at, at birds outside and I'm preventing her from uh, fulfilling or fulfilling that uh, cat dream she has? Well, okay. First of all, I want to say, I don't love the word autonomy. I don't you notice I don't use oh, it. The reason is that it had its origin in the 18th century struggle against religion. And what autonomy meant was the absence of heteronomy, meaning being bossed around by religious leaders and governments. So, I mean, Jerry Schneewin's great book, The Invention of Autonomy, makes it clear that its sense is deliberately anti-clerical. 
and you know, therefore, I, I, it brings in a lot of baggage that I don't think we need. So I just use the word practical reason and choice, which is more neutral. But anyhow, I think you know, with companion animals, we have an issue which doesn't arise in the case of all animals. Namely, we live in a community. We live in a community with them, and there are other members of that community. And of course, in the, in the city or the town, there are other members who are trying to live. So I think it's often the responsibility of the human companion, not simply to thwart, but to shift the attention of the predatory animal to a different target. So, I mean, if you simply blocked her from going out and scarfing up the little birds, that would be not good for her because she needs some kind of predation. But there are substitute activities, and I'm sure you know, that is games with balls and strings. Mm-hmm scratching posts and so forth. And so long as you do that enough and she's not showing any kind of frustration, then I think it's okay. She doesn't need the bird in particular. That's just one outlet, but for something that could have other outlets. But yeah, I mean, if if it were a big cat in the wild, it's much, much more difficult and we'll come to that. But I think we shouldn't be interfering at every point in that case. But Companion animals, they gotta got to live with us, and like children and like other humans in our community, they, they have limits, and the limits are set by the opportunities and rights of others. Hmm. <clears throat> well, as a, a first step uh, towards getting to how we should deal with injustice, we first need to talk about how we ought to recognize injustice, because this isn't... I mean, most people sort of have a a blind eye toward what's happening in the world, and I'm certainly willfully one of them at times. Uh, But in the beginning of Justice for Animals, you talk about three uh, emotions or states in particular that are important to recognizing and reacting to injustice, and they're wonder, uh, compassion, and outrage. Or this last one you refer to, or you change to sort of transition anger. But how do these fit into your theory? Well, I think, I mean, of course, first of all, we need examples to work with. And so I do, from the very beginning, give examples, pigs and gestation crates. And in each case, Mm. I contrast one picture of the animal going about its business flourishing. And like the pig in T.G. Woodhouse's novels, who's flourishing in the beneficent surroundings of Blanding's castle where everyone gives her good food and they love her. And so then you contrast this with the way most pigs live in the U.S. in a gestation crate. You can't even turn around, can't sleep or lie down, no society of other pigs or humans. So I do that with pigs, with birds, with dogs, and with um, other whales. This is another one. And elephants. So I, I mean, that's mm-hmm. just a sample, of course, that I decide to start with a pretty rich sample and look at the different kinds of thwarting. The whale, in my example, is thwarted by plastic that's ingested and fills up the stomach so that the whale can't take in any other nutrition because plastic looks very edible, but it isn't <laughs> digestible. So the whale gets filled up and then it's just gone, really. And it's washed up on the shore and we find the plastic inside. What happens, of course, there are many other things that happen to whales, but that's the one I pick. What happened to the dog is various kinds of ill treatment from a bad uh, so-called owner. What happens to the elephant, in my example, is getting poached and getting killed for the ivory. And then the young elephant is snatched away and put in some zoo in the U.S. where they know that the surefire char- emissions charge will be put up to see baby elephants that are so cute. Anyway, so those are contrasting portraits of the elephant flourishing and the elephant poached and so forth. And then those, I think, once we study them and we try to think of examples in our own experience or our films we've seen and so forth, they should awaken, first of all, wonder. That is an emotion that takes you out of yourself. Wonder, I think, is the least self-referential emotion. Most emotions have have the you in it in some place, even grief, because it says, oh, this person was important to me. But wonder says, wow, how could, how, how could that do that? Isn't that amazing? 
So it calls us outside of ourselves to study and be charmed by another creature going about its business. But then if we see that creature being thwarted, then we have outrage. But I wanted, and then I make the distinction you mentioned. So a lot of people think that anger is a retributive emotion, that it means payback. And I think, of course, it usually does mean payback. But that, I think, is not very helpful to humans or to any good cause. What is helpful is the part of anger that I call transitioning. When you turn around and face the future and you say, that's outrageous, it had better not happen again, and I better see what I can do to make it not happen again. And of course, in the middle usually comes compassion because we're drawn to that animal suffering. How could it be that that baby elephant is snatched from its mother, the mother is chilled, and the baby elephant's thrust into some terrible zoo. There's one in Wichita where the baby elephants are in a little teeny, teeny enclosure and so forth. So that's those are the three emotions that I think we need to cultivate every day. And whenever we see things, we should ask ourselves, isn't that amazing? You know, and I think we usually, when we see an animal we've seen many times before, we usually don't stop to admire and to have wonder, but we should. And, you know, even with the most familiar animals, squirrels and hedgehogs and all the things around us, we should have wonder. I'm very proud of my city because the Chicago Tribune almost every day has a front page story about some amazing variety of animal. Often oh, it's, really? Yeah, often birds because there's a large birder community in Chicago, so they get their info from there. But oh, here's a particular, the piping plovers. And they've become really popular in a particular part of Montrose Park have been named has been named after these two piping plovers that usually nest there. So people all over the city get to know these birds that they probably have never seen, but with wonder because they're good writers and they describe the mating rituals of these birds. But they talk about other animals as well. And of course, sometimes then it's a darker accent. They've done great exposés on pink farms in other states. Illinois does not have such a bad problem with pig farms. Iowa next door is the worst in the world. So anyway, we in good journalism every day. You see it on the front page of your newspaper. If you still read paper newspaper, but I think, you know, online you can get it too. And so then you start thinking, those poor animals, how could that happen to them? And then you want to help and you think, well, what can I do to help? And that's where the outrage comes in. Shouldn't happen going forward. What can I do to make it not happen going forward? And luckily, we live in a time when there are thousands of things nearer to home that people can actually do. And I, I really feel there's great room for hope because the transition anger in the human case, you know, sometimes you feel, well, I'm outraged by police racism. Well, what can I do? But with animals, you know, there's a thousand things you could do every day. You could work with your alderman to pass good laws against puppy mills. And I have to explain to the audience what puppy mills are. They're these bad breeders who bring up puppies in a very bad environment where they're confined. They have lots of parasites. They're not exercised. And then they're marketed as cute little puppies in pet stores far away from the actual breeding place. And the problem with regulating puppy mills is that the puppy mills themselves are almost all in Missouri. And therefore, oh. because they're big biz in Missouri, the government of Missouri has repeatedly vetoed legislation regulating them. The governor vetoes it and so forth. But then the only way you can stop it is at point of sale. So if they send it someplace else, you can say, you're not allowed to buy that puppy mill dog. And one particular alderman in Chicago, Brian Hopkins, who might greatly admire, has spent a lot of his effort making it illegal to purchase in Chicago a puppy mill puppy. It's very hard to identify them, so there are lots of, it had to be redrawn a lot of times. But what, what it means is to acquire a companion animal in Chicago, whether it's a dog or a cat, actually, it has to be a shelter animal from a recognized registered animal shelter. Now, of course, it's not perfect, because then if you really want the cute little puppy, 
you go to the suburbs. So each city has to do it again and again. But that's why we need a whole army of young people working on this. So you know, Naperville has good laws, but what about the one next door and, and so forth? So there are just so many things people can do. Speaking of the piping plover in Chicago, do you still have those wonderful but not indigenous green parrots in Hyde Park? I have not seen them for quite a long time. I, I think they're still there, but they, of course, they don't come out. They're there all year, but in the winter, they, they don't manifest themselves. I don't know whether you would say hibernate, but I think we'll see this spring whether they, they come out again. The, the Canada geese, of course, get more numerous all the time. And, yeah. uh, and that is a little bit of a problem because they were hostile to other animals. But anyway, no, the, the, the funny green parrots are really remarkable. Mm -hmm. One thing I think worth noting since you brought up the Tribune is it brings to mind a, a practical problem that you've already pointed to, but um, it brings to mind Peter Singer's, I'm not sure if the paper is called The Drowning Child, but it's a, a oh. it's a, an example about a drowning child where anybody who sees a, a child drowning in, in a pond as they're on their way to work would jump in and save that child. But of course, on the other side of the world, there are plenty of children in, in dire straits that we do not uh, really think twice about donating money or anything to save. And I think that's it's a very similar problem with uh, justice for animals and that it's, it's wonderful that the Tribune has these stories on, on the front page every day but out of sight, out of mind. And I think that's one of the problems that's holding justice for animals back because if everybody were constantly having these images of pig gestation crates uh, in the back of their mind or plastered on walls, we would probably be doing a lot more uh, about that. Well, I think, you know, there's nothing wrong with starting locally because hmm. that's all we could do in many cases. Without being objectionably paternalistic, we can't tell other countries what they should do when international law is its own problem. But of course we can get people to notice. Now, I just finished every two years, all faculty members and staff at the University of Chicago has to take a, a training called Protecting Children. Now, the reason is that there are a couple of programs in the university that involve experimenting with children or uh, there's a nursery school for children. So because there are children on the campus, we have to do this Federal, federally mandated training. It takes about three hours and the software wasn't working this year. And, oh, it was a big mess. And I, I really felt I didn't have to do it every two years. I remembered it perfectly. And I think it's very, very funny that people grouse and grouse about Joe Biden's memory because he can't remember something that happened three years ago. And we are not, every person young and old is expected to forget everything every two years. But anyhow, we are expected now, we're mandatory reporters, every time we see a child in a variety of different kinds of distress, which we learn to identify through these tests that we take, um, we have to call the authorities. And I want the same thing to happen for animals. I want people to be on the lookout when they see an animal in distress, whether it's because of so-called owner's bad treatment or because it's hungry and astray. We want mandatory reporters to call up and say, you know, this had better not happen anymore. And there's no reason why when we have a Department of Child and Family Services, we could have a similar thing for animals. No such program is perfect, but it would make people more alert. I mean, I know myself that I have actually learned something from this training, much though I hate having to do it every two years. I've learned about what are the signs of child abuse and neglect. And we could do this. We could do this for animals. And so there are lots of other ways, of course, through teaching children, through museum trips, through films, that we can get people to be more alert. And I, I do think good journalism is one, one part of that. Hmm. Well, now uh, moving toward some of the philosophy and then building toward, of course, the, the capabilities approach, you examine three main alternative theories of justice for animals, each of which uh, has problems that you explain, and then you explain why the capabilities approach does not encounter these problems. But the one I think to start with 
is the so like us approach and with that the scala nature yeah well let me first say that the person i'm going to be criticizing stephen wise died three days ago and he oh, was wow. a, he was a wonderful hero for animal rights and i think he was a great hero so much so i disagree with the theory behind the approach i think the fact that he pioneered the study of animal law the first person to offer a course in that in an American law school and his non-human rights project, which is flourishing and continues after his death, has done so much to litigate for the rights of animals. So I want people to understand that this is a hero. I, I don't think the theoretical framework is, is the best. But and in fact, I do submit amicus briefs for the cases and human rights project. I use the capabilities approach, uh, but you know they want me to do that. They want many points of view. So what, what WISE does for pragmatic reasons is to build on an idea which has been around, not from Aristotle, I hasten to say, and I've actually recently written a very detailed scholarly paper about how Aristotle, who's usually charged with this idea, did not have this idea, hmm. uh, an idea that's ascribed to Aristotle, but it's really medieval Aristotelianism, namely that nature is arranged in a grand hierarchy with, of course, God way up there someplace. But in terms of the creatures on the globe, humans are at the top because of language and reason. We're supposed to be closer to God. And then animals sort of descend in sequence down through the ladder. And the idea is that the ones that are closest to us are privileged. And so that is the idea that Wise picks up. And he picks it up not because he thinks it's true, but because he thinks that most people think that way. And therefore, if he's going to sway actual judges in actual American courts, it's a good idea to use. I don't. I think it's better to start with a good idea, not one that you think can easily be refuted. So anyway, why do I not like that idea? Because the truth is that nature is not hierarchical. It right. has wonderful horizontal complexity. Each animal has its own abilities, you know, it's evolved to survive in a particular ecological niche, and it has just the abilities it needs for that niche. We have some that we use, but, you know, there are animals who have senses that we lack. Birds have the ability to pick up on magnetic fields, which we totally lack. And, of course, they can fly and orient themselves all over the globe, which we could never do. It's like a kind of inbuilt GPS then the dolphins have the ability to utter a call that's particular, that signals a particular individual that is the call only to that individual. And they can you know, pick up on one another's calls in that way. They also have the ability to find out what's inside an object they approach through echolocation, a kind of sonar-like ability. And one example that I give is there was a, a dolphin in the, in the theme park and she was taught by her trainer to learn a signal for pregnancy to use for other dolphins. So she would signal to the trainer when another dolphin was pregnant because she could see what was inside, so to speak. But one day, she made that signal to the trainer herself. And the trainer thought, oh, God, she just learned the training. And so better train her again. But in fact, she was right. The trainer was pregnant. She just didn't know it yet, and she hadn't taken the test. So that's the ability that animals have that we don't. And there are lots, of course, of other things. Elephants use frequencies too low for the human ear. Many animals use frequencies higher than the human ear. And they just have the abilities they have and the ones that they need, and even the ones that we tend to think are low, like rodents. They're some of the most resourceful and intelligent. And indeed, most rodents have metacognition, that is the ability to think about the cognitive states of other creatures. When you see a squirrel hiding a nut, that exhibits metacognition because it's already thought, where can I put this nut so that other squirrels will not go there? And of course, dogs, we know, also have metacognition. They, they deceive their owners all the time. Any animal that can engage in deception, and that's a large group, is possessed of metacognition. So anyway, you know, this isn't a hierarchy. The animals have what they have, and they're quite wonderful. Their social abilities often vastly transcend 
powers, their abilities to cooperate in large groups, to make peace without war. Franz Duval, the great privatologist, his first book was called Peacemaking Among Primates, about how bonobos, which are as close to us as chimps, but they're a different species, how they diffuse conflict by initiating sex. The mm -hmm. females see that conflict is in the authentic. So they present their rear end and they initiate sex. So that's, you know, he says, make love, not war is their motto. And they really do execute it and they don't have big wars. So there are all kinds of things they do that we could learn from if we weren't so arrogant about our own abilities. So I think for him to go to a court of law and say, well, because chimps and elephants are very like humans, and those are the two species he's been litigating for, therefore, they should have the ability to get on with their lives. Usually what's at stake is being transferred from a, an inhumane zoo to an um, animal sanctuary. Well, you know, why is that the reason? The reason should be because of them, not because of us. And, uh, you know, another thing I don't like about his approach is that he shows the abilities of animals by showing how they can imitate human performances. So like apes can learn sign language. Okay, you can learn sign language, but in fact, it's just a trick because they don't use it in their own lives. So it doesn't really show much about their own lives. And he shows, you know, how they can watch a TV broadcast and then they make signs indicating distress at what they see the humans do. But it would be much better to study their rich emotional repertory within their own community. So that's what I don't like. I think that, you know, judges are smart enough these days that they can actually learn what's true. And I talk about some court cases, and we can get to that later, where judges, you know, whether they or their clerks, who knows, they've actually learned something about a species quite distant from themselves. So that's what I would like him to do. But, you know, the, the young people who are carrying on the Non-Human Rights Project are perfectly happy with that. And they keep, I think, now that he's not, no longer living, it'll probably go increasingly toward the capabilities of George because they keep asking me to say, what is it about the elephant form of life that makes it wrong to keep this elephant in severe confinement and so forth? So I'm happy to do that. So that is my disagreement with that approach. But I think, you know, we can converge in a very happy way. Hmm. Yeah, I I find this question of the, the Scala Nature so fascinating because we are in some sense just as evolved as flies or mice, making the reasonable assumption that we came from come from the same proto life, except their generations are so much shorter than ours. One might argue that they've evolved more like microbes are, evolve um, or adapt very quickly. And we've simply developed capabilities specific to the problems we confront as species, just like they have. And then by many measures, creatures like, Insects or even microbes are dominant on Earth over humans, and microbes even made the atmosphere that we could not live without. Yeah, so that's true. Mm -hmm. And of course, there there are lots of other things one could say at this point. One one can also say that you know there if we say oh we're the oldest we live the longest, not true. The bowhead whale has a much longer individual lifespan. We're the most resilient and able to breed under and harsh conditions. No, rats are by far the most successful reproducers. And so, you know, and are we the best morally? Good heavens, I would not say that we are. We, we pride ourselves on the ability of moral reasoning. But as I say, there are animals who have solutions to conflict going well beyond what we actually put into practice, no matter what we say. And uh, what about beauty? Well, you know, we think we're very beautiful. But I always remember Gulliver's Travels, which I read as a child. And, you know, Gulliver goes and lives with these creatures called the Quillums, who are horse-like. But they're very, you know, of course, horses are extremely beautiful. But in that community are also creatures called Yahoos. And the Yahoos are sort of, sort of like humans, but they're not clothed. They're rather smelly because, of course, they're an underclass, so they're not given the opportunity to bathe themselves. And Gulliver learns to despise the Yahoos, but he is very careful to keep his English suit on at all times. And at one point, they start to realize that he actually has underneath that a 
hairy body and so forth. And then they start to not like him so much anymore. And when he gets home, he can't live with his own family because he's learned to find the human smell and shape disgusting to him. So, you know, disgust is so complicated. And I think one of the, something I've worked on all my career, that we learn to feel disgust for the bodily in lots of forms. And that's a huge social problem. I, I would say common to most forms of discrimination is the portrayal of the subordinate group as a hyper animal and hyper bodily. It's part of racial discrimination, part of discrimination against women, part of transphobia, and so on and so on. Hypersexual, hyper animal. But of course, that of course it's part of our discrimination against other animals. Because we kind of say, Oh, we're angels. We don't have any bodies. We're Gulliver with his suit on, you know. And then we, we think all the animals, because they're just body, they're terrible. And of course, in the US, it was such a terrible furor when the theory of evolution started to be taught in the schools. Do you know about the Stopes trial in 1928? There was this law in the state of Tennessee, who knows, it might be passed again, you know, <laughs> saying it's illegal to teach the theory of evolution. Well, of course, the minority of Americans actually believe in the theory of evolution. But anyway, it was illegal to teach it. And the reason was that it insults humanity to portray its origins in, uh, as coming from apes. And so when this teacher decided to test the law, John Scopes, and he was arrested, and then there was this big show trial where William Jennings Bryan argued on one side and Clarence Darrow on the other. The whole thing became that wonderful play and then movie, Inherit the Wind. So it's a wonderful piece of history. But in any case, what they all thought is, it's worse for humans if we're thought to have a kinship with apes. And so, you know, the hatred of animal bodies and the hatred of ourselves, if we thought that we were an animal body, which of course we are, that is a large part of human life and human history. And it's a very baneful form because then it does lead directly into the typecasting of black Americans as ape-like. And so right. you can see how that happens. And so I feel like it's something that really infects the whole idea of the scala natura. I mean, one reason to steer clear of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so much for the, the scala natura and the, and the so like us approach. The next one that you survey and which is still very much alive, uh, especially with eminent animal ethicists like Peter Singer, who I've already mentioned, is the utilitarian approach. And for our listeners who aren't familiar with utilitarian ethics, even though we have a lot of philosopher listeners, there are also physicists and, and general, generally curious individuals. How would you distill the utilitarian philosophy into a motto. Okay. Well, I tell you first, don't think about modern economics because that's not philosophical utilitarianism. It's not what Singer is doing. It's it's really its own thing. But what the British classical utilitarians did starting in the late 18th century, Jeremy Bentham, is to try to systematize social planning and policy making by saying the goal should be the greatest aggregate pleasure or satisfaction, and by the same token, the minimization of pain. And Bentham explicitly said, pain is the one bad thing. Every other bad thing is reducible to that, and pleasure is the one good thing. Other later ones have substituted satisfaction of preferences for mm -hmm. pleasure. But in any case, the idea was to make choice making simpler by introducing something measurable so that you could really aggregate and maximize. It was a, a, an idea to you know, make choice making less hostage to personal grievances and personal preferences. So it had a noble aim, was to make things more equal for everyone. Because as Bentham says, each to count for one, no one for more than one when you do this calculus. But of course, he wanted to include animals too. So in the middle of his big book, was a footnote saying, well, actually, you know, animals also feel pain and they're just like us in this respect. And the question should not be, can they reason? It should be the question, can they suffer? He wrote quite a lot about that. 
not all of which was published in his lifetime. He did think that if it's urgent for human survival, it would be okay to kill and eat animals. But any other more optional thing like hunting and fishing for sport, he thought should be illegal. And again, he didn't publish all this in his lifetime. So the Bentham Project at the University of London is publishing his works and as we speak. And one of the consequences, by the way, that he drew is that a lot of our public policy making is phobic about the body and about animality. And he thought particularly laws against same-sex sex came out of that. And we thought, ooh, that's very animal, isn't it? Because, of course, reproductive sex is okay because it's decreed by God, etc. But sex just for pleasure, and in particular sex between men or sex between women, is not, <laughs> not reproductive and therefore is bad. But so he wrote quite a lot about that, and he could not publish that in his lifetime. But he wanted to decriminalize laws against same-sex orientation and activity. And so that, I think, is one of the very interesting things that we're learning now. So Bentham was a great hero, you know, but again, there's something a little off about what he's doing, and he was followed. Okay, let me just give the history. His student, his great student, John Stuart Mill, made a number of modifications, which I totally agree with, and I think my view is actually very close to Mill's. The first modification is to say, well, you know, pleasures differ in quality, not just in quantity. You can't compare on the same scale the pleasure of reading a book with the pleasure of hugging a friend. They're just different things. So you have to start thinking, of what are the different things that we want people to be able to do? And the second thing he said is there's a value of dignity and respect that should be part of this. And he thought it should be part of respect for animals as well, because Mill, too, included animals. And I, I wrote, write about that in the book. He wrote less, he's less well known on that than Bentham, but he left all this money to the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. So he was a much more subtle and multifaceted account of animal dignity and animal, I would say, animal capabilities, really. But so it just didn't have the one thing. But then Henry Sidgwick, a great Victorian philosopher, didn't like that because he mucked it all up and made it too complicated. And he thought that politicians just could not make these calculations unless they were given something extremely simple. So he thought society should be run by a group of elites who told the politicians how to make these calculations. And he rejected Mill's changes and went right back to Bentham. Now, Peter Singer comes along, of course, much later, and his, his version is slightly different in the sense that the satisfaction of preferences is preferred and pleasure, but it's still supposed to be, and this is an increasingly explicit in his writing, a single thing without qualitative differences, commensurable only in quantitative terms. And, you know, he therefore thinks that of all the bad things in an animal's life, deprivation of society, deprivation of space to move around, they're all reducible to physical pain. And I think that's too simple. You know, I, I, I was nil. We're more complicated than that, and animals, too, are more complicated than that. They do need freedom from pain, and if we only got rid of the gratuitous pain that we cause animals, well, that would be a huge progress, and I'm totally on board with Singer and most of what he wants to do, campaigning against the factory food industry. But it's too complicated because an animal might live a pain-free life in terms of simple pain. And yet, you know, it would be living alone without a society of creatures of its kind. And it wouldn't even feel that as a pain of deprivation if it had never known what that life could be. So that's a problem that economists talk about under the rubric of adaptive preferences. It forms its preferences in accordance with the very bad state of life that it actually knows. So I think it's too simple. And that even though, of course, Bentham was right, a simple goal is easier to talk to politicians about than a complicated one, but it's better to have the one that's right and correct. So I differ with Singer about this, but as I say, I think, again, he's a great hero of animal rights, and if we followed his program, we would 
get rid of some of the very worst abuses against animals. So, you know, overall, I feel like we can get agreement on a lot of the worst issues. So Singer, has, throughout his career, and he, his great book, Animal Liberation, just came out in a new edition, he's focused on the terrible pain and suffering caused to animals in the factory food industry and what we humans can do about that. And I, I applaud that. But I, again, I just think it's too simple because animals need more, just as we humans need more than the, the living for bodily pain. So the simplicity of the preference utilitarian account, it might be good and, and rough and good, rough and ruddy, effective theory for getting us to deal with the the worst of animal suffering, but you need something that is more comprehensive and right, like the capabilities approach, in order to make sure that you're addressing all these many dimensions of an animal's life to ensure that they have a flourishing life. Yes. And now the, the other thing that utilitarians don't always talk about, but they have to talk about, is the utilitarianism is an aggregate. It says we should maximize the mm. diminution of pain and the increase in pleasure. And so, you know, complicated empirical calculations are required because human beings love their meat eating and they love, you know, the, the things that cause great distress to animals. And that pleasure has to be weighed in the balance against the pain caused by the animal. And the ones who are at the bottom of society's scale, namely the animals, don't get any special treatment. So philosophers like John Rawls, who think it matters greatly for justice what the worst off are fair, how they're faring, you know, they don't get any satisfaction from utilitarianism because it is an aggregate. And Singer just kind of waves his hands and thinks that if we do all the calculations, the animals will win. But I think it's just not at all clear. And, you know, why should we have to do these calculations? We should have respect for each animal as an end in itself. And that's where, of course, we get to the next approach that we're going to talk about. Christine Korsgaard's book, Fellow Creatures, is a wonderful book. And it does take Kant's approach. Of course, Kant thought very ill of animals, but she then uses materials from Kant, particularly the idea of treating each creature as an end in a, in a very resourceful way. Anyway, so I agree with her over a long measure of things, and my critique is we don't have time for. But um, the capabilities approach, as I say, asks the central question, what is each person able to do and to be. And what we want is spaces for the animal to make choices of things that activate its own ends. And those are usually the ends of its species. So a rough cut might be to describe the general roles for a species. But of course, that should leave lots of room for individual creatures to choose to activate one species goal and not another and so on. But anyway, that I think leaves... It, it treats each individual creature as an end, and so the goal of policy is to protect each one by one, not making you know some grist for the mill of the happiness of others. And it also allows as much variety as we like. So when we make up the list of which capabilities should be protected from each creature, that's where we have to do the hard thinking. And we have to consult with scientists and probably have a group of knowledgeable like, champions of a given type of animal to say, well, these are the things that matter in an elephant life. Scientists have done this already. There's a thing called the elephant ethogram. I suggest you might look that up. It says these are the most important things that elephants want to do. But you can really look in many, many places. The Cornell Lab of Ornithology has a huge amount of information about birds, but also about forest and pygmy elephants. That's another thing they do. So anyhow, we, we make this list, and then we try to figure out, well, okay, where where are we? What could we do to make this more possible? And then, of course, it depends which animal it is. Does it live in a particular nation, or does it live across national boundaries, and so forth? But But the core of it is just to see how we can move this world toward making an animal more capable of living its characteristic form of life. So let me give you a court case that actually put this into practice. This is one that I, I like quite a lot. NRDC, National Resources Defense Council, 
versus Pritzker, who was Penny Pritzker, that is our governor's sister, not the governor, and she was Secretary of Commerce in the Obama administration. And what it did was to take on the U.S. Navy's sonar program. Now, that was a pretty bold stroke. But it's the only way that U.S. law can protect coastal creatures because we won't have rights over the high seas. There we have to get into the murky and complicated world of international law. But these coastal whales were being impeded by the use of high-frequency sonar by the Navy. And so it invoked a statute. Fortunately, there was a good statute on the books, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which made it a crime to harass and various other things, a marine animal. And you ha- you were required under the statute to have the least practicable harm to that creature. And they said, you know, sonar is not of that kind, is not really needed for national defense. It's te- They were just testing equipment and so on. And here's what the whales were unable to do. And it went through a lovely description of whale life. They weren't able to migrate in the way they wanted. They weren't able to breed in the way they wanted. They had emotional stress. And so it went through this whole list of the impeded capabilities of these coastal whales. And it said, you know, that's too high a price to pay. We can get rid of that. And it made that program illegal. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that the capabilities approach would do. And I, I would love to think the judges knew my work, but they didn't, of course, it was too long ago. But I think what happened was they looked and they had this wonder at the whales. They, this case was tried in Seattle and people on the West Coast are much more sensitized to the wow of, of nature. And so they really, you know, they're doing things that other states are not doing. By the way, Oregon just yesterday protected the resident orcas and under their they have a state version of the Endangered Species Act, and so they've given new protection to these very stressed out whales. So there are all kinds of things happening under state law, but this was a, actually a federal statute that they used. And I think they were using, without knowing it, the capabilities approach. Hmm. I want to really briefly return to something that you said about utilitarianism and then how it connects to the capabilities approach. But you mentioned that one of the problems with the utilitarian approach is that it requires highly complex empirical calculations to ensure the aggregate maximization or or pleasure or minimization of pain. But you also already mentioned that you developed the capabilities approach with the Nobel laureate economist, your friend Amartya Sen. And I'm wondering if the the distinction is that the the CA is more theoretically rigorous, developed in an economic framework in part, but it doesn't actually require much calculation? Well, look, it's not quantitative to the same extent. You you know, you yes, you have in the human development reports of the UN development program lists of countries and rough proxies that quantify how they in, instantiate people's capabilities of various kinds. But, uh, you know, it's understood that the goal would be, and this is explicit in my version of the human approach, that each and every citizen has a fundamental constitutional right to a threshold level of those capabilities. Now, then we have to say, what is the threshold level? And that's, you know, but that's a typical thing that constitutional law does all the time. What is the threshold of free speech right and, and all of those rights? And so we know how to do that through litigation and adjudication. And that's how I imagine the capabilities approach being implemented first in a nation, if we could ever get there in the international law world as well. But in practice, we're going to have to start, I think, with the worst abuses and only, only gradually approach the ones that are closer to the threshold. But yes, I think it does require very fine-tuned things. But if you think about the whole history of free speech litigation in the United States, it's very technical. It has a long historical tradition, but it's not quantitative in the same way. It's about, you know, you have to have a singular plaintiff who says my rights were violated. And then we look at what's happened to that plaintiff and we say, oh, was that below the threshold or above the threshold? Is it compatible or not compatible with 
uh, the First Amendment as we understand it. And then we use that as a precedent, and then it applies to everyone similarly situated, and go from there. So that's a different kind of technical exercise, and it doesn't involve puddling the pleasures of one person together with those of others. So that's it's, it's the utilitarian thing that I object to, is that the ones at the bottom get no special attention. Whereas in constitutional law, you know, in principle, at any rate, each and every person has a free speech right. And that's, uh, of course, they need lawyers and they need money to get lawyers. And that's what the ACLU has been doing for its whole history is to make it possible for the less well-off people to get people possessed of their constitutional rights. But the rights are designed to be rights for each and every person. So that's my picture of animal rights, too. Mm -hmm. Well, in the interest of digging deeper into the capabilities approach and seeing how it can be so useful in tailoring our understanding of justice toward individual animals and different species, what are the central capabilities um, and how do they function in the theory? Where do they come from? Well, the central, uh, it, it depends what species we're talking about. Mm -hmm. The central ones are those that would be thought to be the spaces for choice that are most important for that creature in pursuing its characteristic form of life. The humans, I've named this list. It's, of course, humble and completely correctable and revisable. But it has some things that I think probably would pertain to those species, namely protection of life, protection of health, protection of bodily integrity, protection of the spaces to use senses, imagination, and thought, protection of practical reason and choice, protection of a wide range of forms of affiliation and sociality, protection of spaces for play and leisure activities, spaces for connection with other species and the world of nature, and finally, control over one's material and sort of social environment. So those are things that are very general, of course. So we couldn't go anywhere in even writing a constitution unless you quickly got more specific. But I think it's good to start with the general. And what I noticed as I was thinking about animals is that's kind of a general form of what vulnerable animality needs in this world. You know, I, I think it's a pretty good guide, at least as a first cut, in starting to think about other animals. And then, of course, you have to quickly get more specific. What forms of sociality? Because if we protected for dolphins, the kinds that we think we humans need, that would be a bad error. So there's where you need to get highly specific and describe in cons consultation with the scientists the forms of sociality that it would be an injustice to deprive a dolphin or a whale. And so, so that's the idea. And, of course, it requires a long haul. And we, right now, we would probably not be able to make the Constitution for each animal because no one wants to do it. But so I think right now, I call this a virtual Constitution for each animal. We think about what that Constitution would be like for each species of ele elephant, each species of whale and dolphin. And then we would think, oh, here, this, there's a gross violation of this one. Let's leap in and see what we can do about it. Because any approach that's going to do anything in our world has got to be piecemeal and gradual and start with the worst abuses. And so, you know, thinking about one of the worst abuses, let's take that pig in the gestation crate. We notice that it's not just physical pain, which is very bad, of course, but it's deprivation of movement, deprivation of sensory activity. Pigs are very curious animals who like to learn about their environment, and they do it through many, many senses, with a lot of forms of movement, deprivation of the ability even to just turn over in your bed, and subjection to sensory horrors, such as having being forced to defecate where you sleep and eat. Pigs don't like to do that. They hate to do that, but they're forced to do that in the gestation crate. And then there would also be society. We think of, of course, people who only know the pigs on pig hog farms. They don't think of pigs as social animals, but they are. They're extremely 
loving and intelligent and social animals, both within their own kind and across the species barrier. So we would, would talk about how gestation crate deprives pigs of all of that. And then, of course, I mean, it's so obvious that that's bad, you know, that it should be eliminated. There are other judgments that are less obvious. Let's take zoos. Now, zoos, people defend because young people learn about animals from zoos, etc. Now, the first thing I'd say is that used to be the case, but now we have much better ways of learning about animals through videos and films. And you know, let's hope some will travel, but if they don't, they have many resources for learning. But then the thing we have to also think about is what does an animal in the zoo live like? Now, there are some animals that I think can be humanely kept in zoos, but the right way to start is what is the characteristic form of life of that creature, including social life, including space it needs to move around in? Can it lead that characteristic form of life in a zoo and under what zoo conditions? I do think some smaller animals some fish and some other marine animals that are, that are small can possibly be kept in zoos. But the need for a social community is extremely, extremely important. So large mammals, such as elephants, should never, never be kept in zoos. Smaller mammals, such as most rodents, possibly, if they have enough, like a colony of prairie dogs you can see in a zoo, and if it's a rich enough colony, that might be okay. So in every case, what you're asking is, what does that animal want to do? What is its form of life like? And is it able to actually do that in the zoo? Now, marine theme parks usually can't have enough dolphins. The dolphin pod is 35 to 40 animals, and they swim in a large ocean space. So I'm against those two. And so anyway, coastal, there are sometimes coastal dolphin opportunities that you're invited to enjoy. And those are probably pretty bad, too, because they're artificial and you're encouraged to go touch the dolphin, which is not what they actually want. So, okay. But anyway, that shows you what questions I'm asking. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think one major strength of this theory, and then, of course, your approach to it, is how informed it is by science and how science is integral to its continued development and refinement. And to connect this back to the overarching notion of flourishing is the central idea here that science should help us refine the central capabilities that an animal of a given species has a right to. And then facilitating the expression of these rights is the application of justice because it is the promotion of flourishing? Yeah, that's right. But I mean, of course, it would be much better if there was something like the animal, well, con the elephant constitution, the tiger constitution, <laughs> et cetera. Mm -hmm. And we just said, okay, under the constitution, you're violating that elephant's rights. You can't do that because first of all, there's no international law that has any teeth. It's all about protecting humans so they can go hunting whales, and so forth. So we have to do it piecemeal, but we can think of that as a kind of template, an ideal that we could approach. And we can then think, well, in this small way, we're promoting justice. So I, I do think for companion animals, we can get pretty close to realizing the good result for, for companion dogs and cats, because, because the world is ready to go there and legislators are ready to implement what we want to implement, and, and so forth. Birds are, you know, if we can only get rid of air pollution and all the other threats to birds, like crashing into buildings, then that's one area where maybe they would be able to get along and do things on their own that would be okay. There, there is no such thing as the wild. We should get rid of the idea that there's such a thing as the wild. It's too thoroughly, every environment is thoroughly controlled by humans, but the skies, there's a little more room to move around in, and if and the air pollution that we get rid of is good for us too. So birds, we could, we could deliver pretty good results for many birds, and then of course not the ones we eat, they're too thoroughly implicated in our own horrific practices, so we have to really work on that. 
but migratory birds, I think we can do pretty well on if we do things like putting, having buildings turn their lights out at night. Our own law school had corpses of birds out front until the students got upset and demanded that they put up stickers, which was the right thing to do. So, but with the big mammals, the trouble is, of course, they're international and we require cooperation among nations. And if you have one defector nation, you really don't, you can't do it. So like poaching, which I started with, elephants are dying all over Africa because of poaching. And that's because of the ivory trade. There's a very good film called, which Leonardo DiCaprio financed called The Ivory Game. So that tells you about the international ivory trade and how it goes on, co sort of cooperative criminality between Africa and China, where they smuggle the ivory out of Africa, pretend it's ancient ivory, and then it's sold through markets in China to unsuspecting tourists and collectors who think it's ancient ivory. So this is terrible, and, and that, that film gives a lot of good ideas about how to track down the malefactors and stop that trade. But to stop poaching in the first place, some countries really, really want to do that. Botswana is one, and I've been on the eco safari recently in Botswana. But the trouble is, they're on the border of Namibia, and the Botswana army stands on the Namibian border trying to stop the poachers from coming across the border from Namibia. So then they don't succeed, I'm afraid. But in any case, we need much more international cooperation to deliver good results for all, all kinds of, of animals. For the seas, oh, I did a recent article, which people can look up, in the anniversary issue this November of the New York Review of Books about all of the things that are happening to whales. And there's so many. So there's the swallowing plastic. And we can at least get rid of single-use plastic. Then we have to clean up what's already out there, and that's a big job. But we, we know that we could do that if we really set ourselves to do it. But people don't want to do it. I mean, every time I go to my university, I see plastic bottles being used, and I object and I protest to the D, but then the next time I'm there, it happens again. Well, so that's one problem. Another problem is container ships, which are used, of course, for a lot of the commerce in this world. And they make a lot of noise, which pollutes, and that I've talked about sonar. Well, this is like a hundred times worse, mm. and it happens all over the ocean. And then there are collisions with whales that they create as well. And then there's also the oil drillers, because, you know, a lot of oil is under the sea, and they have to find out where it is. So they send air bombs down here and there to try to chart the ocean floor, and those air bombs make a terrible din. So the life of the, you would think, was deep seas are a peaceful place. Oh, no, they're full of this din, and air, whales are under a tremendous amount of stress. One thing we know, because we can measure stress hormones in whales by testing their feces, is that during COVID, things got a lot better. Yeah. Why? Because there was less international commerce. So anyhow, there's that. And then, of course, there's still harpooning that's going on, despite many efforts since Herman Melville to put an end to it. And finally, there's just all kinds of pollution problems. So the coastal orcas, which I, I said, Argon is just protected anew, they have to eat a certain kind of salmon, Chinook salmon. And that kind of salmon is threatened by PCPs in the water. So there's an indirect effect on the, sa on the orcas from the fact that their characteristic diet is impossible. And a different strain of orca that, doesn't, that has a more flexible diet and that can eat seals and sea lions too, they're doing pretty well. So there are just so many things. And then there's the kidnapping of orcas and putting them in theme parks, which is now pretty much stopping, but not entirely. So we just have so many problems to deal with. So all I can say is, you know, just get going, pick your problem and work on that problem. And any young person who, you know, can say to the university, do not use single-use plastic, use cans. Cans are really recycled, like a large percent, anyway, of metal cans. But single-use bottles, they're never really fully recycled. And so there are resorts that I've even been to that only use cans. 
And of course, you don't even need that you can. You can just say to the students, bring your own refillable bottle and you refill it in the water cooler or whatever. So there should be much tighter control of single-use plastic. And that's one good thing that young people can, can work on right away. The puppy mill thing is another thing. And they're just, uh, you know, if you think of the ideal template and you think, okay, there's the idea. Now look how we're falling short with this animal and this animal. What can I do? There's always like a huge list of answers. Hmm. Well, at the beginning of our conversation, I said that I, I wanted to talk about wildness and sentience. And you've just tackled wildness. But now I'd like to talk about sentience. And since you've just talked about um, whales and the, and the meat that they eat, and you've just talk, talked about w a few things that people can do, I think a topic that I really want to really wanted to make sure we got to and that connects to sentience and some of these other things is uh, human consumption of meat. And how do you think about this quite broadly? What's your experience been? I know you've had some interesting experiences with halibut. Uh, so I'd love to just hear all about that. I'm not sure what you mean with halibut, but anyway. Oh, with halibut, I think that you said that you were having some strength issues. And this was in, in the book, you were having some strength issues. And then you noticed that. In particular, I do eat fish. And let, yeah. me, all right, let me tell you what my position is. Okay, the first thing is that creatures that are not sentient are not protected under my approach. And sentient means having a, their own point of view on the world, being able to experience, to have subjective perception and so on. But a sine qua non, it's not the whole of sentience, but a sine qua non is the ability to feel pain. And it usually looms large because that's something people can experiment on. And so there are experiments showing the fish feel pain. And okay. So that is clear. There are other creatures like crustaceans where it looks like they don't, but it's not so clear. The creatures that Aristotle called the stationary animals like corals and sponges, pretty well not. Insects, pretty well not. It's funny because Aristotle used to think bees were, were sentient. But anyway, uh, so, uh, you know, there are others, er there are areas of doubt. Like, interestingly, the fish that clearly do feel pain are the so-called bony fish, teleos fish. But cartilaginous fish, that is sharks, they do these weird things that suggest that they don't feel pain. Namely, if a limb is damaged, they will actually eat their own limb. So that at least suggests maybe they don't feel pain. So we have to keep learning all the time. But anyway, that's the theory. And how you apply it will require further knowledge. But then there's a separate question with the creatures that do feel pain. What is the harm of death? And when does it kick in? Now, of course, some philosophers all along, or since ancient Greece and Rome, have, have debated this question. What is the harm of death? And Epicurus thought that, you know, death was never a harm because if your life is cut short painlessly, well, then one minute you're there, the next minute you're not there, and you can't. You have this illusion that you're going to stick around and watch yourself being deprived of the good things of life. But of course, that's an illusion, but you're just not there. And the way you put it is, when death is there, we are not. And when we are there, death is not. So um, anyway, that was Epicurus. But what I've said all over the years about Epicurus' view is what he neglected is the way that death can cut short and therefore render fruitless certain activities that complicated creatures engage in. So, for example, if you're planning to be a lawyer, you're studying for the LSAT, and then you're cut short in the middle of that preparatory activity, and you never get to the, the full activity, then you're, all your preparation is fruitless. You know, and similarly, if a lot of people spend a lot of their time getting ready to have children, and then they are frustrated and they die before they actually have children, all that preparatory activity seems to be wasted and futile. So I developed what I call the interruption argument, that the bad of death is when it interrupts a meaningful activity that you're in the course of doing, but you don't get to unfold and, and do completely. And that could even just be doing another time 
the thing that you love. I think a lot of us just have our routines of what would be meaningful is to do the thing you like yet one more time. And so that too would be protected. But if you're a creature that doesn't have a richly developed sense of time so that one thing leads on to another, then you and live just in the moment, then you can't be interrupted. And some philosophers like Jeff McMahon thought that all, almost all animals were uninterruptible. They lived in the moment. And so he thought, you know, killing painlessly an animal like that was okay. Uh, I don't think that. I think it's clear that that's wrong. But I do think up till now that that is true of fish. And here I invoke on my side Singer and R.M. Hare. R.M. Hare, the great utilitarian philosopher, wrote a very interesting article called Why I'm Only a Demi Vegetarian, saying that he ate fish if he knew that it had a good flourishing life before, a free range life, and his local fishmonger conked it in the head painlessly. And he could actually see the guy doing it. So, you know, obviously net fishing and line fishing are excruciatingly painful, but this was a a really pain, painless death, and he said that I would eat that fish. And this was in a volume about Peter Singer. And so Singer, replying to all the essays in the volume, said, yeah, he agreed with that argument that if a creature really does live in a moment and you know, ended in the instant, that, that it's okay to eat that creature. He said, the only reason I don't do that is that I'm a public figure and everything I do is watched, and it's too complicated to explain all the all the argument. But anyway, so that's my position, is the position of Hare and Singer if he weren't a public figure. I guess I might be sort of a public figure. And I feel like, you know, okay, I put it in the book. I put the whole, whole chapter on the interruption argument. Anyone who wants to take me up on that should read that chapter. It's very funny, though, because people don't always read a book as a whole. And so there are people who say, oh, oh, well, she's eating fish. What does she need? And I said, well, you know, look at my argument. See what you think. You don't like the argument? Tell me what your objection is. And maybe we differ about the argument, or, or maybe you don't, don't think it applies to fish, but then show me the research and so on. So, you know, I, I'm able to be argued with on this. The, the one thing I will say, I mean, so the, back to your point about strength, is that at my age, which is 76, the pro my protein needs every day are 65 to 70 grams of protein. So I do a lot of physical exercise. To get, to get that from beans and lentils is very difficult unless you have a, an iron stomach and digestion, and I, I don't. I can't digest that larger quantity of beans and lentils, although I do eat some. And dairy, which of course is what a lot of people rely on, that. I mean, I, I eat a lot of yogurt too, but dairy is even worse in, from a humane point of view, because if you really believe my argument, there's no wrong done in the painless killing of a fish that's not a good life. Then you can find out pretty much what kind of life a fish has had if you go to Whole Foods and question them rigorously. But then there's dairy, where the dairy industry relies, and it's hard to know how it would not rely on depriving a calf of its mother and depriving the mother of the calf. We can imagine, and I think uh, Sue Donaldson and Will Kimlicka do a good job here, of imagining a reformed egg industry. And of course, I eat eggs too, uh, for free-range eggs. But we, we don't have to imagine it because it's real. Free-range eggs can make a profit because you just let the free-range hen lay, and then they need a few that they want to keep and sit on but they don't eat all the, the eggs that they lay. But the dairy industry, it's hard to imagine it being reformed and still making a profit. And McDonald's and Chimlica say, well, you might have this boutique industry, but it probably would be so expensive. So that's the problem. What are the alternatives? And so I, I do feel, anyway, I do have an argument, which I think is a good argument, saying I'm not doing any wrong, uh, but, but then I'm further backed up in my own choice by thinking, well, you know, if I were to decide, well, it's too much annoyance to argue with the people on the other side, I would still have a problem with exactly how to live and what to eat. And dairy is not a very good choice. 
So that's what I think. But let me talk about meat eating now. Meat eating is that meaning by that the meat of animals, not I'm putting fish to one side now. That's dead for three reasons. Number one, diet. It's really pretty unhealthy choice. It's just not good for your heart and your organs and so forth. But second, for climate change, because it supports an industry that's one of the largest contributors to global warming. Methane gas is one of the worst things for global warming. So you might want to stop eating meat just for that reason, even if you didn't care about the animals. And then the third, of course, obvious reason is the way it leads to this industry, which is grossly tortures thousands and thousands of animals. So what can we do? Well, my I always favor technological solutions, and I think we have some. Namely, I don't, I mean, the impossible need, I, I think, is more than one side issue. If people like that, it's a form of plant-based food that is more or less healthy, depending on how people make it. But I don't like food that's supposed to taste like meat because I don't like the taste of meat. So that doesn't help me. But I think the more promising thing is actually lab-grown stem cell meat. Now, it still has the health problems, and that's up to you, and you want to incur those problems. But as it becomes increasingly available, that will be meat that doesn't involve the climate damage and it doesn't involve the torturing of animals. So I think that's a pretty good substitute. Hmm. Well, uh, Martha, time has gotten away from us, but this has been an immense pleasure. You're one of the bucket list philosophers I, I really wanted to have on the show. I think you're the only philosopher whose name that my mom knows. So she was very, very oh. excited about this. So does thank you again so much. Does, your mom, does she still live in Chicago? She does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> great. Well, so thank you so much for doing this with me. It was terrific. And thank you so much for your book. Okay. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed it. It was a great pleasure.